You're a man who's famous for many things, not the least is building a better mouse. The world has been beat out of door for 35 years. I'm dating the beginning of that path, of course, from 1928 and the release of Steamboat Willie, the picture that introduced sound to the cartoon and Mickey Mouse to the world. Was it actually the first cartoon in which Mickey appeared? Uh, yes, in which Mickey appeared, yes. Uh -huh. But I was making cartoons uh, long before that. In fact, uh, I think I've been in this business about as long as anybody living today. I started actually in the... Um, uh, to make my first animated cartoons, uh, 1920. Of course, they're very crude things then, and uh, I used uh, all sort of little puppet things. We didn't draw them like we do today. I used to make little cutout things, and joints were pinned, and we'd put them under the camera, and we'd maneuver them and make them do things. And, and this so was before this, you came to Hollywood, actually. Oh, yes, this started back in Kansas City, Missouri, where I was uh, working in the... Uh, Oh, we made the little advertisements for theaters. It's equivalent to what you see in TV commercials today, you know? Uh -huh. Put your winter coal in early, you know? Get your uh, your uh, uh, fedora block for the winter <laughs> and uh, all those kinds of things. Get your... Oh, this was back in the days when the, they had the uh, old canvas tops on cars. Get your top renewed. Uh, I used That's to still do... necessary, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and there was one little thing I did there as a... You had to think of little gags, little catch things, you know. So I had this uh, spanking, uh, shining car drive in. I had a character on the street. He, he hailed the driver, and he says, Hi, old top, new car. And the guy in the car says, No, old car, new top. <laughs> <laughs> then we go into the pitch of the, where to get them renewed and all that stuff. Well, I, I was uh, dating uh, Steamboat Willie simply because it was, um, A, Mickey's first appearance, and also the first introduction of sound to the cartoon. Now, in, in the case of Steamboat Willie, I suppose some toucher came first and sometimes sound came first, or was it always picture first? No, in the days of Steamboat Willie, it was picture first. And then we used to put the sound on afterwards, and uh, in those days you couldn't do what we call dubbing today, where you could mix a lot of tracks. Uh, it wasn't yet uh, science that, uh, that uh, you could get away with, so we used to have to do everything at one time. And we used to have to run the cartoon. We'd have the fellows with the sound effects. We had the people with the voices. We had the orchestra going. And everybody had to synchronize. And hit that thing right on the button. And we had a, we had a way of doing it, though. We had a little kind of a little beat that worked up and down. And, and uh, there were so many of those beats, you know. And they were all musicians working for me. So they could follow those beats. And when it came to a certain number of beats, they would go, ah! Or they would go bang, or they would go this, or they would pop one of these pop guns, you know, and they would always fit. It was kind of opening night for everybody. Oh, yeah, it? it was a madhouse. <laughs> it really was. Well, after Steamboat Willie, of course, came the Silly Symphony. So many of them so happily remembered. And, and not quite ten years after Steamboat Willie, we saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, first feature-length cartoon. Yes, just about ten years how, how go, long was it in production, Walt? I actually started to uh, plan the picture about 1935, and I fooled around with it, uh, trying to get a hold of a story and things for a couple of years, and finally it began to gel. Then I uh, went to work on it. I finished it the fall of 1938. And I didn't know what I had or what would happen or anything. We had the, the family fortune. We had everything wrapped up in Snow White. In fact, the the banker, I think, was losing more sleep than I was. And fortunately, they thought, oh, we, we put it in, premiered it, and everything else, why, everything was, was fine. The banker was happy. And the following spring along came that Academy Award. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, it wasn't but <laughs> about two years later that I was almost broke. <laughs> well, two years later Again. was uh, uh, following Pinocchio and coming into the Fantasia period. Yeah, uh, that about did it, you know. <laughs> that, but that was a artistic new Artistic success, <laughs> financial failure. You know? Certainly an artistic success. It was a well, it's a, it's some people would uh, would question that, too. And I, I recall a, a new and, and musical Mickey standing in for Leopold Stokowski. Well, that's what started. I was uh, doing this uh, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice with Mickey Mouse, and I happened to have dinner one night with Stokowski. And Stokowski said, oh, I would love to conduct that for you, you know? Well, that led to not only doing this one little short subject, but it 
got us involved where I did all the Fantasia, and before I knew it, I ended up spending 400 and some odd thousand dollars getting music with Spakovsky. <laughs> <laughs> but we were in there, and it was a point of no return. We would have made it. But it was certainly worth it every foot of the way. Well, he's a great guy, though. I don't want to belittle Spakovsky, but uh, he, he is a great musician, a great artist. Well, perfectionism always costs money, I guess, and that's certainly something you've always been after. Uh, well, I was always known as the perfectionist until I met Stokowski. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a new member of the club, yeah. indeed. Well, about a year after the release of Fantasia, uh, Robert Benchley, I remember, joined you in explaining to audiences all over the world how you go about making a cartoon. What are the, uh, the principal technical advances since that time? Well, better drawing. Uh first thing I did when I got a little money to experiment, I uh, put all my artists back in school. We, uh, uh, the art schools that existed then didn't quite have enough uh, for what we needed, so we set up our own art school. Well, you were inventing a new art anyway. Well, yes, but we were just going a little bit beyond what they were getting in the art school, where they worked with the static figure. Now, we were dealing in, in motion, movement the flow of movement, the flow of things, you know, action, reaction, all of that. So we had to set up our own school. And out of that school would come the, the artists that uh, now make up my staff here, and more than that, the artists that make up all the, most all of the cartoon outfits in Hollywood, uh -huh. where, directly or indirectly out of my school. Well, of course, everything is people, and it was the, uh, the individual and, and collective talents of these artists. I was only asking if there had been a technical advance uh, in that mm, your own work in the cartoon field seems to have acquired so much more depth and so much more. Yes, there are many technical advances, but basically the thing that gives us more depth is our uh, the, the ability to draw the way it should be drawn for this medium. So you get a lot of depth out of the way you, 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 you shape a line, the way you, you draw the figures. That contributes an awful lot to the depth and to the uh, overall effect that uh, you see today with the cartoon. Well, now, in the, in the early 1940s, we saw Saludos Amigos and uh, a little later the Three Caballeros, the latter being the first combination of live action and cartoons. Tell us a little about how those two pictures came into being. Uh, so which one, the Saludos Amigos? That, that uh, I, I presume, kind of... Uh, <clears throat> led you to the Three Caballeros. The well, that was, uh, I was asked by the government to go to South America and uh, kind of a cultural thing, you know, before the, uh, for, you know, those, pre those Nazi days. Yeah. And I went down with the staff to see if I couldn't make some films about the uh, ABC countries down there. You know, there's uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. And they first wanted me to go on a handshaking goodwill tour, and I said, I don't, uh, I don't go for it. I'm not a good handshaker and everything. And then they came back and said, well, you go down and make some films about these countries. I said, well, that's, that's my business. I can do that. Take a pencil in your hand. That's yes, right. So I took a staff, and we set up headquarters in, uh, in, uh, oh, in Rio. We also uh, went and set up a studio in uh, the Argentine. We went over to Chile, and some of my artists, we divided a party. Some of them went up to Peru. And when we came back, I made these four short subjects. We brought back uh, the Tico Tico tune that was being played down there. And I brought that back and put it in. Brought back Brazil. And both of them became standard tunes okay. here. And we, out of it, we developed this little uh, Brazilian parrot, uh, Jose Carioca, who played with Donald Duck. Anyways, these four films were uh, put more or less put together, and they went out in the theater. And, of course... It was one of those things that uh, they thought Disney needed the subsidy, but, you know, fortunately, that little thing went out, and it did a heck of a business, and the United States government didn't have to put up one nickel. Oh, wonderful. It was actually a goodwill tour for the government. And it was later, about uh, about two years later, that the Three Caballeros then became I, the new That project, was a follow-up, yeah. Combining mm -hmm. live action. Yeah. I almost need happened. the subsidy on that one. <laughs> Well, I gather that Mary Poppins, currently in, in production, is a, is a further development of the combination of live action and, and cartoon. Yes, you might say that. We have a, a, a sequence in Mary Poppins that, uh, where we, we have the live characters in with the animated drawings. But basically, Mary Poppins is a live musical fantasy. Mm -hmm. The whole story is, is carried out by live actors. And it's, uh, of course, we have a lot of tricks 
uh, of the trade here that we incorporated into Mary Poppins, such as they fly around and, and all of that kind sure. of stuff, you know. But still, uh, it's basically a live action musical fantasy. Well, after the wonderful uh, cast, by the way. Well, let's let's change the subject uh, for a few minutes, uh, Walt, from uh, film activities to outside activities. Perhaps I should say outdoors activities. I'd like to talk to you about Disneyland. Where did you originally get the the first notion for Disneyland? Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with you know different things, and I take them to the merry ground and I took them different places and as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground did all these things sit on a bench you know, eating peanuts I felt that there should be something built some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together so that's how Disneyland started well it took many years it was a, a whole period of maybe 15 years developing I started with many ideas, threw them away, started all over again. And eventually it evolved into what you see today as Disneyland. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them, too. <laughs> well, now that uh, Disneyland is flourishing as a place of dreams coming true, uh, who, who goes to Disneyland? What is the ratio of adults to children as part oh, of the point yeah, of father and uh, daughter? Four, four adults to... One child, that is, uh, we're counting, though, the teenagers as adults. Of course. But, uh, of course, in the wintertime, uh, you can go out there during the week and you, you won't see any children. You'll see the all the oldsters out there riding all these rides and having fun and everything. At summertime, of course, it, the, the, the average would drop down. But the over a uh, year-round average, it's four adults to uh, one child. And, of course, there, uh, in, in my knowledge, there's only been one adults who's uh, been refused permission to the park. No, we didn't refuse them permission. No, we were all set. You see, we work according to what the State Department wants to do. When they come in, they they, uh, they have guests. If he's, uh, Khrushchev was a guest of the government. So, I mean, we were ready to receive Khrushchev. But it so happened that uh, the security problem here in Los Angeles, because actually uh, Disneyland is in another county, you see, and the uh, chief of police, we can't blame him. He had a, he had he had quite a, a chore there to carry out. He just uh, was was a little worried about uh, somebody maybe walking in Disneyland with a shopping bag and what they might have in it. He was never able to know, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But exactly. we were ready for him. The press was ready. The uh, both the State Department security and the Soviet security had come and cased Disneyland, and they were all set. And I was already and. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had a lot of dignitaries down there, and, I should and say. He, he was one that Mrs. Disney wanted to go down and meet, was Khrushchev. Yeah. So uh, she was disappointed he didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it's certainly not ever an empty place, so I can understand the security men's uh, concern. I had we had different shops, places where we take pictures with Khrushchev, and I had one that was my favorite, where I uh, we lined up in front of my eight submarines. And I thought, well, it'd be nice. I've been pointing to Mr. Khrushchev and saying, well, now, Mr. Khrushchev, here's my Disneyland submarine fleet. <laughs> <laughs> it's the eighth, uh, the eighth largest submarine fleet in the world. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be seeing part of the, uh, the tour that the submarines make uh, presently, so it's, uh, it's interesting to hear about. What, uh, what was the initial cost of the Disneyland that uh, first saw the light of day? Oh, it goes back so far. I had different cost estimates. Uh, one time it was three and a half million, and then I kept fooling around with it and got up to seven and a half million. And I kept fooling around a little more, and pretty soon it was twelve and a half. And I think when we opened Disneyland, it was seventeen million dollars. And then it grew like topsy to today. It is today. going on forty-five million dollars. My gosh. Well, now today the the newest and most exciting aspect of, of Disneyland is is what uh, I. I turned this over on my tongue several times, what you call audio animatronics. Yes, audio animatronic figures. Uh, it's a, uh, well, it's a sort of a, another door that's open for us. You see, our whole 40-some-odd years here has been in the world of making things move, inanimate things move. 
from a drawing to all kinds of any little props and things. Now we're uh, making these uh, human figures, dimensional human figures move, make animals move, make anything move, through the use of electronics. It's a, it's a tape mechanism that... Uh, the tape, it's like a se uh, programming or sequencing when they do a missile, when they're sending some, some missile to the moon, say. At different stages, at different times, things must happen. That's all programmed, predetermined. So our show is put on that tape, and it's programmed from this tape. And we run it off a little one-inch tape that has 14 tracks. And on each track, we can get up to 16 signals. Now, those little signals go and impulse this figure and make the figure move, make the figure talk, and everything. Well, look, I could show it to you a lot better than, <laughs> than I can tell you about it. Will you come over here, and I'll give you a little preview. I should say. Well, here we are, Fletcher. This is a little audio electronic setup for the parter, the parter kit, so to speak. Now, these are not working from tape. These are manually controlled. This little gizmo here, kind of like a joystick on the old type airplanes is what gives us a chance to program the bird. And as we work this and get all the little movements that we want in the bird out, we record it on the tape. And then from then on, the tape will do everything that we've done here. Sit down. We'll have a little uh, go at this thing. Now, this is uh, not part of our Disneyland show. I mean, you know, the tiki room. This is a little robin that we had in Mary Poppins. Ah, and this little bird sang a duet with Julie Andrews. Maybe we can get a little response from it. Uh, hello there, kid. What can you do for us, huh? Can you sing, whistle, anything? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> now this is uh, <clears throat> one of the characters from the Tiki Room. He's actually a substitute. In other words, if uh, one of our uh, master ceremonies, we had four macaws who act as master ceremonies in the Tiki Bird Room Disneyland. And uh, they actually keep the show rolling. And along with them are other birds who sing and things, and flowers that sing. And then the tiki images, you know, the carved tiki poles and things with yeah. these tiki gods. They sing and they drum, and we have quite a show. But this is the boy that takes care of it. In other words, he's, he's a stand-in for one of them, you know. He's very alert. <laughs> Throw out your chest. Show them how big your hands are. <laughs> now, this is Fletcher Marco of uh, CBC. I'm sorry. I didn't catch the name. Marco. How do you spell that, sir? M-A-R-K-L-E. M-A-R-K Marco. That's right. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, whatever your name is. A uh, uh, what is my name? Well, I'll tell you the truth, we haven't given them a name yet. How would you like, uh, Jose? Ah, muchas gracias. Excuse me, an accent. <laughs> How do you do, Jose? Now it's official. How do you do? Oh, missed my accent. <laughs> well, that's just a little demonstration of audio animatronic figures. See? Now, let me make sure I understand what, what happens in, in controlling these birds by these extraordinary instruments, mm -hmm. you can at the same time record their movements on a tape? That's right. After we get it programmed, it's like rehearsing the show. And you go through it and rehearse it and rehearse it, and you finally say, that's it. And we say, all right, let's go for a take. And as we go for a take, all the things we do here are recorded, and then when we play the tape back, he will do everything he's doing here. Only it's all part of a program show, you see? And I, I understand, then, that the next step beyond the birds has been to do the same kind of programming with human beings. Yes, with human beings, yeah. I'm not going to replace the human being. I don't believe me, <laughs> but just for show purposes, because now you take Disneyland down there, we operate 15 hours a day, and these shows have got to go on. Go on on the hour. Now, my Tiki Bird Show goes on three times an hour, and I don't have to stop for coffee breaks and all that kind of stuff. You see? So that's the whole idea of it. It's just another dimension in the animation that we've been doing all our life. It's now we're going into dimensional things and everything. It's a new door. It's a new toy for us. And we're having a lot of fun. And uh, we hope we can really do some exciting things in the future. May I try one here? Yes, you go right ahead. How about a song then?
What about you, Jose? You got anything to say? Hasta la vista. <laughs> That's right. Hasta la vista. Well, let's go over and finish our keys. Right. Well, Walt, let's change the subject again, if we may. I'd like to ask you now about uh, your accomplishments as an international film producer and that you've made films in how many countries in the world? Oh, uh, I can't recall because we've done a lot of our nature films and our, uh, we had a series called People in Places where we went over Japan and different places, even over into the uh, uh, Egyptian area. But I have been basically uh, making films in... Well, England first, with our British company, mm -hmm. and then in Canada. I mean, uh, as you know. <laughs> well, our, our telescope viewers are, are naturally interested in, in your plans uh, for Canada. They remember well, of course, Nicky, the wild dog of the north, which I think was your first Canadian production. Yes, we did that between Cal Calgary and Banff. And uh, we worked with the Canadian Wildlife for, uh, uh what would you call it? The Canadian Wildlife for Society, I guess. Is it Society? Well, it's the government. It's the government. Anyways, uh, they let us have an experimental station that they had uh, was abandoned or weren't using. And we put our company there, and they went right through the winter, and we got some wonderful uh, stuff on the film. And then with, with the second film, you went to, to eastern parts to make Big Red mm -hmm. for the locations of yeah. Big Red. And um, coming up uh, in the next few days, uh, Canadians are going to be seeing your third Canadian production, The Incredible Journey. That's uh, Sheila Burnford's uh, best-selling uh, story of this. I it's one of my favorites. I think the animals in that are terrific. I, I, I hate to say that to you, Fletcher, because you directed the humans. <laughs> I'm always partial to animal actors anyway, you know. <laughs> well, I found the animals pretty pleasant, too, I must say. But it's, uh, it's certainly the animal's picture. And one of the most remarkable uh, animal stories uh, of its kind that uh, I've ever read let alone had anything to do with as a film. I, I gather, Walt, that you um, first found out about the story even before it was published in, in North America. And uh, it yes. During its English publication. Yes, it was. First published in England. And uh, we had, uh, that's where we uh, caught on to it. You had your plans long before it became a bestseller. Yes, we got into quite a hassle, though, on who, uh, some bidding went on to get that story. And I, when it all ended up, and... I found out it was my good friend George Seaton was bidding against me. <laughs> George apologized. He said, I'm sorry I run the price up on you, Walt, but he said, I didn't know you were bidding against me. <laughs> <laughs> These are things you could never know about in advance. Actually, the, uh, the part of the Canadian story uh, that interests me more than any other is, is the fact that your father was born in, in Canada and lived uh, a, a good part of his life there before he moved to parts to the south and, and began producing sons. Yes, he was uh, born in a uh, little town, uh, I think they call it Bluevale. It's right out of Godrich. And uh, my, uh, the Disney family were uh, Anglo-Irish, and they migrated over there in the 1830s, at, uh, which makes me feel that the Disneys had foresight because it was 1840 when they had the potato family in Ireland, but they were smart enough to get out before that. And my father was born there, and he was raised there, and went to school there. He, in fact, uh, he went to school in Godrich. And he was about 20 years old when my grandfather went to Kansas, out in the same area where uh, General Eisenhower, ex-President Eisenhower, came from. And he, uh, he was an alien, of course, being a Canadian, and he had to buy his land. He couldn't homestead. And he bought a section of railroad land, and that property uh, stayed with the Disney family until uh, just a few years ago, and my uncle had it, and, and he, I told him, I said, before you sell it, let, let us know. And uh, so finally he wanted to sell it and retire. And I went to my brother, I said, let's buy this, this virgin land that our ancestors, you know, acquired. And he said, what do we want with farming land? He wouldn't go with me. So I didn't go ahead. I found out later they struck gas and oil on it. <laughs> well, you can't win them all. No. <laughs> Tell me, Walt, have you been back to, to your father's homestead at all in recent years? My father and I had planned to go back because as, uh, as a boy, my father always told me about uh, his boyhood in Canada. And uh, you, you see here, Fourth of July is a big deal here, but my father always referred to the Queen's birthday, and that was Victoria. And that's when they had their big uh, doings, you know. And I always uh, wanted to go up there with my father because 
As a youngster, you know, he told me about all these different things that he did in, in the country. He thought it was the most beautiful country in the world, and yet he'd come down here to live. And uh, he died before we had a chance to do that. Well, after your father's death, did you finally get a chance to get back up to the old homestead? Yes, I finally made it. I took Mrs. Disney along. Now, she's not too interested in uh, ancestors and things, you know. Uh, when we got up there, she really fell in love with the town of Godrich. A beautiful little town. And she was quite happy about it. But I wanted to find my uh, the, the homestead where my, uh, my grandfather, you know, went out and cut the trees down and pulled the rocks apart and where my father was born. So they gave me directions and everybody was trying to be helpful and everything. And Mrs. Disney reluctantly went along and I found this old place and I said, this is it. There, it was really deserted. There were cows running through the house and chickens around and I had my camera, and I got out, and I photographed that thing from every angle. And uh, when I got through, I found out I'd photographed the wrong homestead. <laughs> well, ever since, Mrs. Disney has never forgot. She, she tells that to everybody about when Walt went up to Canada, and he photographed the wrong homestead, you know. Well, let's, let's leave that in, in the past where it properly belongs, and look ahead for a moment to, to the future, Walt. What's, um, what's on your... Uh, immediate schedule. I gather there are some projects for the World's Fair in New York. Yes, they're more or less uh, of, uh, an extension of Disneyland in a way. We're doing uh, four shows for the World's Fair. Four? Uh, yes, it's uh, about $50 million worth of shows that we're doing for the World's Fair. Of course, that includes the cost of the building, the rent of the land, everything. We're doing one for the Ford Motor Company. We're doing one for General Electric doing one for the uh, Pepsi-Cola Company and the state of Illinois. These are, these are uh, when, when you say extensions of Disneyland, uh, are, are any of them uh, uh, audio-animatronic? In yes, audio-animatronic and, and the dimensional type of, of uh, shows like we do at Disneyland, not film shows. There's no film involved in any of these shows. We, uh, we use our audio-animatronic figures. And at the uh, state of Illinois exhibit, they're going to have great moments with Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln is going to be there. He's going to, to speak five times an hour. He's going to be very lifelike and very, very believable. And we've, we're finding some wonderful words of Mr. Lincoln that are still prophetic today. And I think it's going to be a great moment for the public when they can sit and hear Mr. Lincoln talk about some of the things. What, what is liberty, you know? the rights and the obligations that we have and all of that. I think it's needed today, too. I should say it is. But, Walt, um, it's, it's very difficult to talk about rewards because certainly you, you've had so many of them, 29 Oscars and nearly 700 other awards from all corners of the world. But personally, what, what has been your greatest reward to date? Well, my greatest reward, I think, is that uh, I've been able to build this wonderful organization. I've been able to enjoy good health. And uh, the way I feel today, I feel like uh, I can still go on being a part of this thing after 40-some-odd years in the business. And uh, also to have the, the public uh, appreciate and accept what I've done all these years. That, that is a great reward. I'm sure it is. It, it seems unlikely, but if, if you had it to do over again, would you do any part of it differently? Well, if I had it to do over again, uh, I think, uh, no, I don't think it would. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I don't have to do it over again. <laughs> <laughs> There's certainly a, a, a completely unique reward in having that feeling about your work and what you've accomplished. Yes. That's, You're right. that's a reward of satisfaction and happiness, surely. Yes. What, what does happiness mean to you? Well, of course, I mean, happiness is a, is a state of mind. I mean, that you can, uh, if you're of your own doing, you can be happy or you can be unhappy. It's just according to the way you look at things, you know. So I think uh, happiness is, uh, uh, well, contentment, but it doesn't mean you have to have wealth. But all individuals are different. Some of us uh, wouldn't be satisfied with just carrying out a routine job and, and being happy. 
Uh, yet I, I, I envy those people. I, I had a brother who, who uh, I really envied because he was a mailman. But he had all the fun. He had himself a trailer, and he used to go off and go fishing, and he didn't worry about payrolls and, and stories and, and picture grosses or anything. And he, he was the happy one. I, I always said, he's the smart Disney. <laughs> <laughs> smart. 